Okay, the first thing is those glasses were left at the beach club. If somebody recognizes them, no, they can pick it up and otherwise they'll be put at the reception. So some glasses were left at the beach club. Okay. Now, about the gala dinner tonight, it's about 1.5 blocks away from the Oasis Atlantico Hotel on the right if you face the sea. You just, it's basically facing one end of the artisanal market, which is on the beach, the other end being the Oasis Atlantico. So if you find the Oasis Atlantico, you just walk in direction of the end of the market and you will see basically this building. And there is a small side street. You just take the side street and the entrance is on, in that small side street. So it's really about one minute walking distance from Oasis Atlantico and you will recognize this hotel. Those of you which can, you can look also on the website of the club. But anyway, it's easy to find. Uh, what will happen is people which are at Oasis Atlantico, we can say that we leave five minutes before five, uh, before eight, sorry, and walk together. But anybody can find it very easily. A lot of you have probably walked past this building when you exited the hotel, I mean, in the last two days. Okay, so that was an announcement about the gala dinner. Now, to go back on the scientific program, our next speaker is Soren Brunak from the Biocentrum at the Technical University of Denmark, Lingby in, in Denmark. And... Uh, Soran is the director of the, of the Center for Biological Sequence Analysis, CBS. And he has many activities, but his group, he and his group are so well known around the world for implementing machine learning language, neural networks, and HMM, um, among other things, approach for detecting, I mean, sequence signal, you could say, in the DNA and protein sequence. Uh, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. But I think also what's important is not only his scientific activities, but he's also active in a lot of committees which have to do with bioinformatics. And why do I think this is important? Again, to go back with the first day where I was speaking about funding and so on, it's nice that some people spend time in those committees trying to push you know, forward bioinformatics in Europe. So thank you, sir, and for all of those activities because it takes time to be part of those committees. And uh, that's something which is not so recognized. I mean, people recognize, you know, so scientific work, but it also should be acknowledged, all of this work. Now, as geographic link, I put Lingby, of course, and Copenhagen and Stockholm, where you have studied and worked. As bowling, there could be a lot of it. I put, of course, Pierre Borg, Gunnar von Hein, Ramek Gupta, which has worked a lot with you, and under Sprague. Just before I let you talk, I mean, you cannot read all of the names of the programs here, but this is showing just how impressive this list is of all the tools which CBS has put together. Many people develop tools, not so many give them to the user community free of charge and makes them user-friendly and available and update them. So, I mean, of course, in those tools, I think the one which is probably the most used, but I'm not sure in terms of access, is the SignalP and uh, which all of you which have worked on protein sequence are probably used. Otherwise, you're probably not working on protein sequence analysis. So thank you, Soren, for being here. Okay, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Amos, for all these uh, nice uh, works. I had planned on, on a, a much more lengthy uh, sort of uh, expression um, of all my, my uh, thanks for, for all the data that we have used, because most of the methods you saw here on these lists, the data comes uh, essentially from, uh, from SwissProt and, and other database, but as we are quite uh, protein-centric, a lot of the, the, the data... Uh, we owe a lot of thanks to, to, to SwissProt. So this has been an interesting 
um, time since the, the since 86 when we started uh, using these machine learning methods and it's interesting that my talk now is back to back with uh, Bill Pearson's talk because we started looking for problems where alignment would not be uh, able to produce a, a good result um, problems where where you would have a lot of mutually exclusive um, correlations in the sequences and this is essentially also what this talk uh, is about uh, trying to solve uh, problems in systems biology uh, and in compartment understanding where alignment will not be uh, able to, to produce a good result. We should, of course, use alignment uh, as, uh, as much as we can. We see the machine learning techniques as something that complement what you can do with alignment. So uh, we're interested in identifying not just categories of proteins with signal peptides. You can actually do that with alignment to some extent, some, some decent uh, extent you can do it better with machine learning techniques. But if you are interested in sort of biochemically very diverse protein categories, like for example, all the proteins that are running the cell cycle with periodic transcripts, all the, the proteins that are periodically uh, transcribed, all the genes that are periodically uh, transcribed that runs the cell cycle, all those proteins, if you are interested in identifying those, alignment will not help you much because they are very different uh, sequence-wise. So we are basically interested not in plugging sequences into the usual uh, biochemically well-defined categories, but we are interested in, in, in wiring uh, categories of highly diverse proteins, and we use machine learning techniques and data integration techniques for, for, for that. And the cell cycle will be one primary example that I will be talking about today. Here you see some array data over there where you take different time points and then you see that different genes, uh, they peak at different times during the, the, the cell cycle. And obviously you cannot align your, uh, yourself to the protein complement that is involved in that process in, in, in any, any uh, organism. Similarly, if you go, for example, for uh, an entire compartment, and we have worked with the human uh, nucleolus, then you're in a similar situation. These proteins don't share a whole lot of, of uh, features, uh, just when, when you sort of, or at least they don't share one feature that can used, be used to, to uh, plug them all into uh, a, a, a data set. You need to integrate all these features and look at the correlations between them in order to, to try to to um, uh, isolate that subset of, 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 of sequences. So we integrate a lot of data, and, and one of the data types that we focus on and have focused on uh, together with, with uh, collaborators uh, like um, Pierre Borg and Matthias Mann is protein-protein interaction data, and you will hear about that in, in, in this talk. This is obviously a data source that grows rapidly. This is not completely new statistics, but again, you can see how how the different databases are taking off with, with this type of data. And this is obviously a very valuable type of data. If you want to model a system, you know more if you know the two proteins interact than if they are just co-expressed and so on. So this is a very valuable uh, source of, of data, but of course very noisy because we, we, we think that half the data in the databases are, are, are wrong. But we're looking at this data explosion in all, at, a, at all kinds of, 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 of data. But as Amos also alluded to, there's much more that can explode. Uh, and and uh, in the area of modeling using protein-protein interaction data, we should remember that we have seen a very small fraction of the data. So the type of modeling we're making today, we can redo that in a year and in two years' time and presumably obtain much better, better results. So we are basically, when we look at these systems biology uh, problems, interested in ident identifying the, the uh, components. We are also interested in wiring the uh, components. And as you will also see, we're interested in obtaining sort of a temporal view of how the interactions um, uh, take place uh, over time uh, in, in, for example, a process like the, the, uh, the, uh, the cell cycle. And uh, we're interested in, in finding out whether we through this data integration can identify uh, new uh, principles and, and we are of course also interested in, in finding new components that participate in, in, uh, in, in such uh, an important uh, process like, like the cell cycle. 
So if we uh, look at the cell cycle, the typical uh, technique is uh, to use uh, microarrays. You synchronize the cells, and then you, you perform experiments at many time points, and then you get uh, expression levels out, and then you can make Fourier analysis of, 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 of uh, the data. Uh, and you can also sort of peak assign. Uh, this is two cell cycles you see here. Uh, but, but when people have done that, for example, for yeast, it's clear that, that the uh, sets they identify they, they differ a lot. So, um, so it's clear that prediction, so these are, are sort of uh, noisy techniques with a lot of, of uh, weakly expressed uh, genes. So we try to see whether we can cle clean up the data using some of these machine learning techniques. And uh, the idea is to compensate for, 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 for the noise, of course, but also to compensate for, for the lack of experimental data in, in, in some cases. So, so we are not just making prediction approaches like you saw on the page that Amos showed, where we predict a kinase-specific phosphorylation site or a signal peptide, but we would like directly to predict some of these global properties where we predict whether or not a protein is likely to be uh, protein, uh, cell cycle regulated or not, or, or, or uh, coded for by a gene that is periodically transcribed. And similarly, you can go for some of these other broad categories like secreted by a non-classical pathway or member of, of, of a nucleolar subproteome and so on. And the way we do it is essentially to use the features that we normally predict to predict these uh, global uh, categories. So we sort of move the problem from sequence space where we have no similarity we can exploit to the feature space where we hope that there are similarities between the proteins that uh, participate in a given process. For example, cell cycle regulated pr proteins, they obviously need to be degraded in some kind of periodic manner if they need to, to, to be there uh, in, in, in a periodic uh, way. They also need to, to, to uh, be removed again. So despite the fact that they are very dissimilar sequence mice, they might share some patterns of degradation, for example, that, that tie them together. So this is what we are, we are looking for. And we use these machine learning techniques, these, for example, these neural networks, to, to look at the features. So we take a sequence, translate it into features, predict phosphorylation sites and sequence peptides and, 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 and transmembrane helices and so on. And then we integrate the features using, uh, uh, using neural networks. So we hunt for uh, features. We constantly make new ones here. This is one of the latest predictors we made of uh, uh, glycation, non uh, insomatically added sugars to, to, to proteins. You can test it out. Uh, here's another one, nuclear export signals that we made uh, recently also. Um, and uh, we also make an, an, an in-glycosylation predictor uh, some, some, some time ago. It's, uh, uh, it's on the web page also. And what you see here is uh, one point that I uh, often would like to make. You know, here we have a data set of human proteins that have sort of been normalized to the same length. And we see where we predict, in what functional categories we predict the N-glycosylation sites. And you see that we predominantly predict them in the transport and binding uh, category. And uh, so many of the other categories, we don't find, find many N-glycosylation sites. And uh, people often don't uh, exploit all this negative information. The fact that a sequence does not contain in glycosylation sites increase the probability that it's a transcription factor, for example. So all the absent information in Swiss prod is actually, in my opinion, maybe even more valuable <laughs> if you could believe it, if, if it was confident than all, all the feature annotation you actually have in the database. A lot of absent features will tell you a lot about the functional category uh, of the sequence. And this is what these neural network techniques uh, exploit when they make their classifications. They are also looking for absent features. Of course, the most well-known is the signal peptide method that we have, have, have made. It's been a, been a huge uh, success. But in this context, we use, to, use it to integrate uh, in, into feature space where we try to make these um, more complicated classifications. So this is also a method that has been uh, cited uh, a lot, and I think we owe many of these uh, citations to, to, to Swiss Prod in, in, in the way I expressed in, in the beginning. The newest paper here managed actually to get on the top of the ISI um, uh, hot, hot list because it picked up one citation per, per, um, per, per day. So, so uh, thanks again for that. We, we normally only show these.
these things to funding funding agencies, but I think we should also show it to the database people because uh, this is where we get the uh, the data from, so that we quickly can make the the uh, the methods. So this is the final uh, network for the cell cycle uh, uh, classification uh, scheme. So we offer maybe 50 features to the method, and then we have a strategy for selecting informative features that will have discriminatory value when we should make the classification. And we are happy to see, we of course don't put any, any of this in by hand, uh, see that for example instability, uh, phosphorylation, pest regions, degradation signals, uh, and so on, are features that in combination, in some weird way of, of, of weird correlated form, actually correlate uh, to, 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 to this uh, question uh, answering this question whether or not the protein is, is uh, encoded by a gene that is periodically uh, transcribed. So for such a predictor here, probabilities will come out, numbers between 0 and 1, and you can actually run it then on the yeast genome. This was on the yeast genome. We did that where we use some part of the genome to train the predictor, and you will get some scores, and, and, and we in this way identified uh, new proteins that, that, that were periodically uh, uh, transcribed, and we actually did put them on a chip and repeated an experiment and actually found completely novel cell cycle regulated genes in yeast in this way. It's difficult to actually find something new because 1,800 proteins in yeast have been suggested to be cell cycle regulated, but uh, if you design your chip and, 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 and your, your oligos, you might be able to, to identify uh, new ones. What is interesting about the prediction approach is that if you, if you skip the left panel but only look at the right one, we see the mRNA level, so the expression levels is on the x-axis here, that our distribution of new genes we have found in this way, it goes to the sort of weakly expressed side. So, so, so the, expre the prediction tool can really complement what you can do with the, with, the, with the chip technology because we can sort of in sequence space, in feature space, see some of these. Uh, more weakly expressed uh, genes, you see the difference between the, the old distribution, the blue one, and, 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 and the red one uh, over here. So, so the prediction tool is, is uh, really complementing what you can do with the chip technology. Of course, when you have arrived at a set, you might not use the predicted data. You can also just use Fourier analysis of, 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 of the um, uh, expression pattern. Patterns you can you can peak assign the, most of the genes so you can tell when in the cell cycle a, a given gene is peaking in in, uh, in expression and we did that uh, in collaboration with with the Pierre Box uh, uh, group uh, 600 yeast proteins we put on on a circle like this so cell division is is, is 12 o'clock here on on, on this uh, circle uh, and we sort of color code according to to the phase when the gene is peaking in expression, so S phase is green. Uh, and, and then we can take this expression data where we have time, and we can go to the uh, interaction databases and pick up interactions between the proteins, and these are the lines you see. And actually, most of the lines you cannot see, you can see on the histogram that most of the interactions we find are between proteins that are peaking in expression close in time, so this is nice uh, to see. And out of, out of this, um, uh, Data integration here, we can, of course, create uh, protein uh, complexes where we, we uh, convert the interaction data into, into protein uh, complexes. Many of the proteins will not find high-confidence interactions, so they stay outside the, the circle. And what came, came out of this uh, work here was an interesting uh, principle that we uh, think is very uh, interesting, that all the protein complexes that we identified in this way is sort of a mixture of these periodically expressed proteins. These are the colored ones and the white ones that you can see that we added that has a more uh, uh, constant uh, expression. So the protein complexes that drives the yeast cell cycle is not sort of a just-in-time phenomenon where all the proteins are being expressed just when they are needed. Many of them are expressed constantly and then you have a subset of the proteins that are expressed periodically that sort of activate the, uh, the, 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 the complexes. So this was sort of a rule that seems to apply to, to all the complexes that we could identify uh, in, in this way. What, so, what also was interesting was that phosphorylation seems to go with periodicity, so phosphorylation 
patterns were much more overrepresented in the dynamic protein. And similarly, um, the degradation signals, the pest regions were also overrepresented. And that sort of explains why you, using the, um, the machine learning technique, can predict using these features, because these features are actually overrepresented in, in, uh, in, in the dynamic, dynamic proteins. So what emerged from this was uh, a picture of uh, cell cycle uh, dynamics that involves uh, a lot of, of sort of uh, protein components and not just transcriptional regulation. A lot of targeted degradation and post-translational modification is, is essential here. So what we have recently done is to, to take this analysis further and, and, and compare uh, with other organisms. And uh, there are data sets, again, as, uh, other people have produced that you can analyze, so you can compare the dynamic proteins in different organisms, and you can also uh, compare different data sets uh, uh, between uh, organisms. Uh, I'm not going into detail with, 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 with that. We have a method, you, uh, you should not try to understand this slide, but we have sort of a method uh, that, that tries to find out what subset of the genome should we include in the periodic complement? And in many of the original papers, they, in our opinion, include far too many. Um, for example, for the Arpidopsis data set, we, we stop when we include 400 proteins. Uh, we think the rest that, that has been added up to 1,100 proteins in, in the origin, original paper, maybe half of them uh, might just be, be uh, wrong because you, you, you add in a random way when you add beyond, beyond, beyond 400. So for each organism, we have a, a subset uh, of, of, of the genes, 600 genes from, from uh, human and, and, and yeast, and 500 from pump and 400 from, from Arbidopsis. And then we, we define orthologous groups, a lot of, of, of work that I will not go, go, uh, go into. But what is very interesting here is that, that when you compare periodicity for these four organisms, for, for this very fundamental process, cell division, uh, where you think that, that, that a lot of the regulation should be conserved, we could only find five orthologous groups that would be conserved. And that is, for example, some histones and, and, and some, some, some other proteins. But, but periodic expression of cell cycle-related genes is something that is very, very poorly uh, conserved, as you can see uh, on, 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 on this slide. Uh, we think that the uh, principle that we discovered using the, the uh, yeast data uh, is the explanation. Here you see... We have looked at a large number of protein complexes, but here you see just three of them, uh, three different complexes, um, and you see the three different uh, organisms here. Uh, but you also see the color coding, so the gray ones are constantly expressed, the colored ones are dynamic. And you see how the dynamic uh, sort of uh, proteins move around in the complex. It's not all the complexes that have the same number of components due to to gene the deletions and, 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 and duplications and so on. But you see that the periodicity moves around. But whenever we find a complex, we find one periodic component. So we think that the explanation for this poor conservation of um, transcriptional uh, regulation is that it really doesn't matter which protein in a complex is dynamic as long as the complex will be activated at the right time during the cell cycle, uh, it works fine. And then there are also some differences in color. For example, in pump, the DNA replication starts early and so on. This is, this is well known. But the basic principle that we discovered in yeast in this way of integrating array data and, and um, uh, protein interaction data seems to, 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 to hold, and similarly, for the PTM story and so on that I will not go, go, go into. So it is possible, it seems, uh, using data integration to discover new, uh, princ uh, new principles that might explain some very odd thing that, that, uh, that, that periodicity is so poorly uh, conserved. It also sort of limits how much faith you should have in model organisms in the terms of, of, of gene regulation. You cannot just uh, transfer uh, regulation uh, from, say, yeast to, to, to human. It can be very different 
and this slide might, might uh, explain why it, it, it still works. So I, I very briefly, here in the end, I only have five minutes, uh, to go to the nucleus story where, where uh, the, the task is again to, to wire an entire uh, system. Uh, here we use prediction essentially to, to take a list of, of proteins. In this case, we don't get the list of proteins or genes from expression data, but from proteomics data. So Matthias Mann gives us a list of 700 proteins that he has isolated from the human nucleolus. And then we create protein complexes out of that, but then we make a predictor in the same way, as you see out uh, there to the left, that we can use to rank the protein complexes. So we only end up with the high confidence protein complexes. And of course, then we also pick up some white proteins here that, 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 that uh, did not appear in Matthias Mann's list. Then we can actually go back into the proteomics data and see whether we can confirm some of these new proteins. But um, the idea is mainly to use, again, sort of a feature integration approach that can be used to predict whether or not a protein is likely to be localized to the human nucleolus, and then use that to rank the protein complexes. And when we did that, we were uh, surprised to see that, that the top 15 that you see here, it is all the uh, expected complexes that you, um, in addition to some unknown ones, but it's the ribosome biogenesis, it's spliceosome, it's exosome, and so on. And of course, we, again, we are not putting this in by hand. We're just taking the list, wiring, and, and then we throw away complexes that has low prediction score from, from, from the prediction tool. And, and uh, even in this high confidence list, we find two uh, complexes that are uh, unknown. It's a little bit difficult to, to, to see here. But you see the, the blue dots here on this slide. These are actually proteins that were pulled into this study by the protein interaction data and where we went back into the um, mass spec data. We asked Jens Sanderson from, from Matthias Mann's group to see whether he manually could find these spectra so that he unambiguously could say that these proteins had actually been, uh, were actually present in, 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 in the sample. So we were able to identify 16 new proteins in this way. And again, you can also, if you have some temporal data, and this is a scale of how fast proteins will leave the nucleolus uh, from a transcription inhibition experiment they made in, 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 uh, in, the, in the, the man group uh, earlier. And you can color code the complexes according to this dynamic scale. And you can see also uh, that it, it looks very nice in the sense that most of the proteins will get the same, same color. So it sort of add confidence to these protein protein complexes. Um, this is the last um, uh, slide here. You see the features that we found to have discriminatory value for making this nucleolus localization prediction. And it's interesting that, for example, transmembrane helices, obviously this is an example of, of negative uh, information. We don't expect the proteins to have a lot of transmembrane helices in, in, in the nucleolus. Interestingly enough, the most informative feature that we could find was propeptide cleavage sites. And it's also clear that we don't expect that, that the proteins in the nucleus will have uh, a lot of, of propeptides. Uh, but then we, we look further at it, and it's clear that this, this feature looks a little bit like a nuclear localization signal. So a look, nuclear localization signal in itself didn't work. It didn't work because we train the network to discriminate between nucleus proteins and other nuclear proteins. But this seems to be a special version of, of, of a, a nuclear localization signal that is more frequent in, in the nucleolus. So the features that we use to make these predictions can actually be, be useful even if they are entirely uh, wrong. So, so there are other features that are well-known proteins in, in the nucleus have more lysine and, 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 and so on. So, so this appear, uh, appeared really recently, so I just skipped. Skip this. So, so uh, what I've tried to, to show here is that, that uh, data integration can benefit also from the inclusion of, of predicted data. The predicted data can be used independently, of course, uh, as you heard in the beginning, but you can also predict data and then integrate it into schemes when you would like to understand um, dynamic processes or, or compartments in, in, in this way. So uh, uh, all the cell cycle work that I had talked about here, we have done together with Per Borg's group and, and, and Lars Jul Jensen. 
very productive collaboration, and the Nucleolus work was done together with, with um, the MAN group, as, as I said. And then various people have uh, uh, contributed at, at the CBS. So thank you very much again for the invitation and your attention. Does it work? Any questions? I just have a question. Do you think you can apply this kind of method to other uh, organelles of uh, time, process, uh, and so on? Or do you plan to yeah. do it? <laughs> De definitely, we have also done it. Uh, all, the, the only thing I can promise is that you can decide whether it will be useful or not. Because we, we can simply set up a data set and then we can see whether we can get a decent correlation coefficient and then we, we can answer whether or not it, it, there is some similarity in feature space that will work for your compartment. And we have uh, other projects cooking where it seems to work, but we have also three, four negative ones where maybe the patterns are entirely at the DNA level and so on. So, so we can decide whether it seems to work or not. It will for sure not always work. Uh, John Garavelli at the EBI. Uh, in your last uh, description there of the nuclear signals, uh, I'd be interested in knowing about the tryptophan content. Was that a positive or a negative signal? I think it is positive, but actually um, I, I cannot uh, remember. But, but I think both the lysine and the tryptophan was, was positive, but we can easily check that. So, so uh, uh, And again, this is a difference between nucleo, uh, nucleolar proteins and nuclear proteins because it is easy, or uh, maybe not very easy, but, but if you include a lot of pseudoplasmic proteins in the data set, then, then it's easy to get a good correlation coefficient. But, but it's more tricky to discriminate between nucleolar proteins and, and other nuclear proteins. And of course, there will be some noise in the data sets and so on, and we have found a lot of errors. But, but I'll have to, to get back to you on, on that one. I think it's positive. No more questions? So thank you very much again.